Joining me around the table, Moa Lathy. He is communications director for the Democratic National Committee. Karen Tumulty, national political correspondent at the Washington Post. And Sean Spicer, communications director for the Republican National Committee. And there you are in the middle, so just <laughs> do that. Uh, let me just start off with the Gates book, because I, I did think it was a, sort of an astonishing uh, timing and really took all out after pretty much everybody. One of the things that's getting the most play, of course, is what he said about uh, Joe Biden. And um, this is a, a quote from the book. The vice president was poisoning the well with the president with regard to Petraeus in Afghanistan, the surge. I said I thought Biden was subjecting Obama to Chinese water torture every day, saying the military can't be trusted, the strategy can't work, it's all failing, the military is trying to game you to screw you. I said we couldn't operate in that way. He also said that Biden has been wrong on every single foreign policy uh, issue in the last 25 years. Does this in any way figure into politics? Because he also had some negative things to say about Hillary Clinton and the president. Well, in, in this town, I, I think everything, uh, folks Waste. want everything to, to, to factor into politics. Um, look, I'm going to disagree with Secretary Gates as much as I respect him, uh, of his characterization of the vice president. The vice president has been a leader on foreign policy for a very long time. Um, uh, whether it was Bosnia, whether it was nuclear nonproliferation issues, he's been on the right side more often than not. Um, I mean, here's what I'd say. If we do want to talk politics, let's talk politics. President Obama, Vice President Biden, Secretary Clinton all came into office on a promise that they were going to end the war in Iraq, that they were going to go after Al Qaeda so that we could draw down and end the war in Afghanistan. That's what we've done. And so if you're going to talk politics, if either of those two, and I don't know that either one is going to run for anything ever again, would anyone that runs on that promise made, promise kept, on that legacy of foreign policy and national security strength that has made America and the world a safer place, they will do well running on that. John. Well, I, I think what, it, what Mo said and what everyone said, Senator McCain, is that Bob Gates is someone that is universally respected in this town. And so when he comes, someone of that nature who doesn't come at this from a political angle has these kind of observations about both policy and politics, how people are coming to these key decisions, it does have an effect. And one of the two is going to run for president. And I think both of them are going to suffer because it's someone who has tremendous amount of credibility and respect in the town. And, and Karen, he did mention uh, in, the, in the book that uh, when it came to the surge, uh, that both that he was astounded that both Hillary Clinton and, and President Obama admitted that politics figured into their opposition uh, to a, a surge in Afghanistan. It, it does make, and, and by the way, he has no love lost for anyone in Washington, apparently. He's hard for the Republicans, though, isn't he? Because there's also implicit criticism of Republicans. That's right, and, and I think that what gives the, the book its power, I mean, there's been some criticism of Secretary Gates for having written this book at all, for the timing. But, you know, this is a man who served under so many presidents and has had to live over the past decade, more than the past decade, with every day knowing that he was committing troops to combat. Right. And that is really what is so extraordinary about this book. It is, you know, it is a view of leadership that we are simply not going to get from any other person. I think well, the timing more than anything is and I think, to, to Karen's point, I mean, the politics of this, especially when it comes to, to Hillary Clinton, that's going to be a big problem. You remember what we were able to do with John Kerry when it came to he was against the war before. It's not always the policy, I think, that matters. It's how do people come to those decisions. Uh, and I think what the book highlights is that for Hillary Clinton in particular, it's all political. It's which way does the wind blow? I've got to figure out how I get on that. That's the, what Gates is getting at, and I think that's what's troubling because except for the fact, except for the fact that, you know, as I said earlier, they all ran. They all ran on a promise to end a war, to end two wars that the American people definitely wanted us to get out of, and they succeeded. At the end of the day, I think that's what people care about much more than he also and he also describes her as idealistic and principled and so intelligent. So they're on almost everything. Exactly. So it, I, I think that, you know, that it, it's a real mixed bag for Hillary Clinton. The, the other thing is, though, he makes it clear that she was on kind of a pretty short leash with this White House, which it could complicate her ability to run on that credential as Secretary of State. And look, and Secretary Gates himself has been saying for the past couple of days that a lot of how his book is being read and is, it's being misconstrued and misinterpreted. And so there's going to be a lot of time to litigate what's in this book and what's not. But at the end of the day, 
anyone that runs on that agenda, on that record, is going to have a strong record to run on. Talk to me about long-term unemployment benefits. Comes up this week in uh, the Senate again. <clears throat> are they going to get this? And and Sean, to you in particular, isn't this a tough one for Republicans who are always accused of you don't care about anybody right. taking on the long-term unemployed? Well, I think we've got to get the message straight. And the message, I think what it comes down to is obviously we as Republicans, our first and foremost responsibility is to help everyone who wants to get a job, a job. Something that's long term, that means you don't have to live month to month, that you don't have to worry about paying that electric bill or your kids, you know, uh, school tuition. That's what our goal is. And so we're looking at long term solutions instead of these short term band-aids uh, that sort of get folks into a, a cyclical uh, aspect of government dependency. What we're seeing on the Democratic side is more of a talking point. They want to box Republicans in and win the debate. They don't want to actually solve the problem. You saw that in the Senate in particular where you had six Republicans join with Senator Reid saying, hey, we will support this if we can help A, pay for it, and B, put some programs and reforms in place that help get people back to work. But for, th This is the big issue for me, is that we have 150 bills that the Republicans in the House have sent to the Senate, including things like the Keystone Pipeline, that will put people back to to work immediately and the Democrats would rather not pass those to have a talking point about short-term unemployment. That's just wrong. <laughs> Sean, I mean, man, I love you, but with all due respect, <laughs> this is this continues to be part of the problem, I think, of the Republican Party. Is they you know to leave but with we just need to get the messaging right. The problem is the agenda is wrong. When you are against a minimum wage increase, when you are against long term unemployment insurance and benefit extension, when you are against all of these programs, when you're against Medicaid expansion, what you are doing is fundamentally not only hurting the people that need the most help as we get back on our feet, but you're actually undermining the economy in general. I will put the Democratic record up against the Republican record on the economy any day of the week when we've had 46 straight months of job growth, private sector job growth, when we have actually helped turn around a fiscal near fiscal collapse. Uh, I will put that record up against you any day of the week. When you are not extending unemployment insurance, not only are you hurting people in need, but you are hurting the overall economy. That's money that gets pumped back into the but economy. The nature of the problem is different than we have ever seen it. The, the rate of long-term unemployed is higher than it has been since, you know, World War II. And both parties are still talking about this from kind of their ideological base, from their... I, I think what people are listening for are some ideas that actually sound creative, that maybe are, you know, addressing the problem as opposed to addressing... Yes, the long-term long solution is how about people get those jobs. Right, that and, and some yeah, of every those... one of those, every one of those, I mean, Karen's right, th we're at the, a 36-year low when it comes to the number of people participating in the labor force, meaning more people would rather give up looking for work than actually go out and, and try to find a job. But the problem is, is that, that as Mo ticked off all these government programs, all of them are alleviated the second you get a good paying job. I mean, all of them. You don't need to worry about the minimum wage most of the time. You don't need to worry about Medicaid. So if we pass, and I know I, I, I go back to it, but it's the easiest thing to go back to. Why are we blocking a, a bill like the Keystone Pipeline that provides or, tens of thousands of jobs with benefits but, that will need no, no dependency on the government, that unions support, that a lot of Democrats support? But what about but, all the people who would lose their jobs? when uh, by by not extending unemployment insurance all the people whose small businesses are supported by these folks actually putting money back into the economy i mean this is actually a no-brainer in that it helps people that are struggling and it helps the overall but, economy but is the question about helping the long-term unemployed or is the question really should we pay for it or should we not pay is this an emergency after six years of this benefit or is it not an emergency and we should find some place in the budget? To it is, it's an emergency because it is hitting every single demographic group. Young people, old people, college degrees, high school diplomas. It's, it's something that I think just about every family in America is feeling right now. Everybody hang on for me. Uh, we do have one more round. Chris Christie's long-term prognosis. Back now with Moa Lathy, Karen Tumulty, and Sean Spicer. Let's just chart this out with a picture being worth a million words. Uh, this is from New Yorker magazine. It's their cover. It's Chris Christie playing in traffic. So I, I think we all kind of get that. And I'd also like to share uh, one of uh, Moa Lathy's 
tweets during the um, news conference, which, and I'm not going to read all of this, but I think it goes to 40, uh, 140 characters. Me, 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 me. Um, you're right there. <laughs> so, which made me laugh. Um, but the, I think my question to you is, yes, he did. Everyone seems to think he did really well defending himself. Is it, there'll be investigations, there'll be more documents, there'll be all of that stuff. But assuming that Chris Christie is totally telling the truth and there's nothing that shows he knew about this, is this over? Is he still a leading Republican candidate for president? Absolutely. Not only that, but I would argue that how he handled this really says a lot about the type of leaders that, that we need more of in this country. I'm not defending what happened, but I think that what America is yearning for is that, yes, mistakes will happen. Do you own them? Do you take responsibility for them? And do you put in, take action to ensure that they don't happen again? Too often, frankly, whether it's you know Benghazi, GSA, the IRS scandal, we don't see me, me, me. We say it's somebody else's fault. Blame somebody else. It's you know I had nothing to do with this. What Chris Christie did was he said, yes, it's I'm the buck stops with me. I'm in charge. I take responsibility for it. I'm going to fix it. We that's something we don't see too often in this in this country, frankly. Right you're, now, you're shaking your head. So let me let you put words to that. Um, uh, what we saw was a two-hour-long display of Chris Christie making himself out to be a victim. That's what we saw. We saw Chris Christie standing up there saying, I cannot believe I was betrayed. I cannot believe that people would lie to me. Not enough of Chris Christie showing real anger about what happened. Here's what we know. He Here's what we know. Here's what we know. That Chris Christie's closest aides did something that hurt the people of New Jersey. He did it, they did it in a very callous way, a word that he himself used. However, however, Chris Christie, while he may or may not have known, we're still waiting to see how the investigation plays out, clearly created a culture where his office, the people closest to him, thought it would be okay. They did something they thought the boss would like. And that's a problem. That speaks to his leadership well, culture, style. The culture of a place certainly does add to things, Karen. Does it, though, bring questions to management to your closest aides did this yes. thing which was all over the, and, and four months later you go I didn't know they were involved yes, until yesterday. It, an intensely personal brand of leadership and uh, I have a story this morning we do in the Washington Post where his former mentor Tom Kane former governor of New Jersey says this guy may be the most talented able politician since Bill Clinton but people are going to ask themselves do we want all that in the White House. Right. I want to thank you all so much, Sean Spicer.